Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this Pink Forest event. Uh, it's a webinar and we will record the webinar, so it will be available later on on YouTube. Um, today, we discuss achieving the forest strategy goals, what can science tell us? And um, we, um, we will have a very exciting panel discussion that our Think Forest president, Janis Potocznik, will uh, lead. But before that, we will have a presentation by Mireya Pekorul on the newest EFI study. But before we do this, we will start our webinar with a video a uh, message from the Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, Mr. Sinkevicius. And unfortunately, he was not able to join our webinar today, but he sent this video message that is now being recorded, uh, shared with all of you. Uh, please wait for a moment until it's uploaded so that we can start the video. Forests are essential for our health and well-being and the health of the planet. Forests fulfill many functions and offer many services to our society and economy. They provide numerous goods and services. They are essential for biodiversity, climate change mitigation, water replenishment and regulation, recreation and health services. And at the same time, they provide wood, food, green jobs, just to name a few. But despite that importance, they are under increasing strain and huge pressure, not just from human activities, but from natural processes too, made worse by the climate and biodiversity crisis. The EU forest strategy proposes a clear vision to overcome these challenges. It's a strategy to unlock the potential of our forests. The whole forest-based sector will be essential in Europe's transition to a modern, climate neutral, resource efficient and competitive economy. We designed the strategy using the best available scientific evidence and in full respect of the competences of the member states. Many of its objectives rely in fact on the member states commitment, but we also need buy-in from the forest sector to endorse its objectives and actively engage in its implementation. One other element is extremely important. If we want to reach the goals of the strategy, we'll need a significant contribution from research and innovation. That's why the EU is funding projects under Horizon Europe and developing the evidence base we need to ensure the sustainable development of our EU forest. This research agenda is remarkably broad. It includes better mitigation and adaptation of forests in the face of climate change, demonstrating the multiple benefits delivered by forest ecosystem services and accelerating the uptake of digital innovations. Together with more research, we also need better knowledge of the situation on the ground. With more monitoring, we can develop our understanding of these increasing pressures, including climate change. The EU forest strategy announced a new legislative proposal on forest monitor, which aims to develop an EU-wide forest observation framework. This framework will provide open access to detailed, accurate, regular and timely information on the condition and management of EU forests and on the many products and ecosystem services that forests provide. In addition, it will use remote sensing technologies and geospatial data together with ground-based monitoring. Right now, we are adding the finishing touches and it will soon be ready for adoption. Improved forest monitoring will give us the information we need on the state of EU forests and their prospects for the future. It will spotlight the most pressing needs, paving the way for the future-proof management of EU forests. Best wishes for your discussions today, and I look forward to a full report on the proceedings. Thank you. I would like to thank the Commissioner for his video message and I think he made a very important point about the EU forest strategy as a policy 
guiding instrument uh, and by also singling out the important role of science and knowledge. But now we would like to tap a little more into what science can tell us about meeting the forest strategy goals in 15 member states. And I would like to invite uh, Mireya Pekorul uh, Putinas, uh, a senior researcher from CTFC, to share with us uh, the latest uh, scientific information, our EFI upcoming study on meeting the forest strategy goals. Um, Mireya, please, the floor is yours. While Mireya is uh, sharing her screen, I just would like to uh, also thank the co-authors of Mireya that were participating in this study. It was quite a large group of uh, participants. So please, Mireya. I'm sorry, Mireya, we cannot hear you because you seem still muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Now I hope everything is fine. I, I was just saying thanks a lot for this opportunity. I'm delighted to introduce this study that as uh, Helga introduced to us, uh, had, it's a collab collab collaborative effort of 15 uh, researchers that we try to figure out what are these uh, objectives of the EU st for the strategy and how uh, they are being implemented in 15 European countries and in one country we also uh, saw uh, three member three, three regions. Um, yeah, so I will go through uh, a little presentation. We will see what are the context, the aims, and then I will introduce you to the main objectives and we will end up with uh, uh, key recommendations. I think one of the most important take home message from this presentation is that what we have uh, figured out in our study is that uh, there is a very high diversity and institutional arrangements uh, playing a role in forest in Europe. All, all policies encounter uh, these policy arrangements and ecological conditions which are very different from Finland to Spain. And, uh, and different economic, social economic importance of forests. And that determines as well how we interpret it and how these concepts are gonna be deployed in practice. So I think what it's important to highlight is that we need to take into account all this complexity to understand that that also has an influence on what are the political choices and therefore will have an impact on how this EU4 strategy is going to be implemented. And uh, that's uh, a very basic uh, idea, but uh, we need to um, avoid one size for all because one size will not fit all. So uh, this is the the group uh, of researchers that we were involved in this study. And our main aim were, was to really identify what were these goals in these national and regional uh, policy areas uh, that are in, were impacting forests. So we, we, we were looking not only at forests, uh, specifically um, policies, but also biodiversity strategies, bioeconomy strategies, energy strategies, all these uh, sectorial policies that uh, their activities also impact on forest. And we were uh, trying to make a comparative study to see uh, to what extent these national uh, strategies were already aligned with what the EU forest strategy wants to see and what, what were the gaps there and what were um, the implementation that already was going on in these countries. And uh, we will not have the time uh, in this little presentation, but we tried as well to understand what were these uh, factors that uh, can explain uh, that this policy is going to be easily implemented or we will face some barriers. I'm not going to get into details that it's uh, the countries uh, that were involved in the country in, in the study. You see, it's, uh, we have a big representation from Nordic countries, but also Central European countries, Mediterranean countries, and all of them they have a unique position in terms of ecological uh, 
uh, richness, different types of forest, different contributions to the economy. It's uh, the Nordic countries contribution of the economy are much, much higher than Mediterranean countries. And uh, forest cover, also the forest cover varies quite a bit into all these. And I'm not gonna go into detail in methods, but we try to be systematic. So we conducted uh, content analysis. We complemented that with interviews of key experts on the area. And also uh, we did a uh, comparative assessment. So what are the results? What this study tell us? Uh, well, first of all, that the EU forest strategy wants to see the socioeconomic functions of the forest increase. And, and the idea to increase that is to put a lot of emphasis on promoting long life products and also the cascade use of the wood. And we saw, not surprisingly, that Nordic countries and some Central European countries that are already working on these lines, especially in God construction industry, uh, they are already quite aligned with these ideas. But also surprisingly, other countries that they don't have these path dependencies are now included in terms like, uh, like uh, bioeconomy for wood construction in their strategies. So it's slowly as well getting relevance in the political agenda also in countries that they don't have this expertise. Uh, uh, another very important point is the new skills and employment. I think here it's also very interesting that many countries also uh, are putting a lot of emphasis on measures to promote that, especially in countries that they initiated already a sustainable energy transition uh, in biomass. So for instance, Italy or Finland, but not only, also countries uh, with a very big emphasis on uh, promoting rural development uh, and this uh, the rural development, it's not always in bioeconomy strategies, but it's a very important priority uh, for, for countries uh, that they have experienced uh, land abandonment, like for instance, Spain, and, but not only, as you see, a lot of countries are really putting a lot of emphasis on this promoting rural development. A big gap that we found it was uh, precisely on another important point that it's how we make collaborate forest managers with the tourism industry. I think many, there is a field that has been initiated in many countries, especially with uh, also recreational and health aspects of forest, but still uh, there is a lot of way to improve here. And I think especially on labels, labels, uh, eco labels that can help also to increase added uh, value products in, in natural areas or that are coming from natural areas. I think another very important point, and actually I think that it's a key point of the study, it's where to put the limits, how to ensure that this uh, timber production is sustainable enough to to not to, um, to 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 be truly multifunctional and and we we saw that a lot in all the countries uh, there were putting place a lot of measures on on this uh, side especially measures that they were reinforcing a lot of forest planning forest management planning as a tool for really uh, making sure that this uh, timber production do not overcome the limits of the uh, ecosystems, but also certification. Certification schemes are also seen as a way to ensure this sustainability. But as I'm saying, that it's really, I think, the core of the discussion. And I think that relates again with the emphasis of this new EU forest strategy on really reinforcing biodiversity conservation and promoting silviculture and forestry practices more uh, close to nature oriented. And uh, that again relates to the bigger debate on what its multifunctionality and what that means in different contexts. So again, you cannot compare uh, a Scots pine uh, plantation in, in, in Finland than uh, you know, like a, um, other types of pine forest in the Mediterranean area. So here, what we see is that uh, different uh, forest strategies 
address this multiply delivery of uh, forest ecosystem services in different way. So, and uh, for instance, uh, here also even in countries like uh, Ireland, they see afforestation as a very important tool as well to increase biodiversity. So all grow forest also, it uh, was also a very hot topic and um, we um, not still well represented enough in, in documents, but a lot is going on on developments at policy level. So a lot of the information we got here was through interviews uh, that were complementing our uh, document analysis. And what is also relevant here is that there is a lot of efforts and everyone was claiming that we need to find a common definition and legis legislative mechanism to, to guarantee that this forest will be protected. And it was a couple of examples where they see that the key factors for making that happen are two. One is uh, to provide financial support for uh, especially private owners that uh, might uh, have this all, all, all grow forest in their land, but also not to exclude active management and, and as a part as well to help this all growth forest to reach this mature status. And uh, we had nice examples of that, for instance, in Catalonia, uh, new, new developments are, are being tested here. But also I will say that uh, we have also a lot of already mechanisms that are taking place in, in Finland uh, and, 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 and I think also Sweden, they have agreements with forest owners. It's a long tradition of that. And other countries, uh, they were claiming that payment for ecosystem services, it's still a concept, but they have not really been deployed in practice because lack of resources. Uh, following uh, also the idea of afforestation, afforestation it's highlighted in many countries in West, Western and Central Europe already. And again, the origin or the path dependencies are quite different. Some uh, countries, they see it more as a traditional forest policy like Ireland or, or the Czech Republic. For others are new developments, especially countries with a very low area in forest like uh, the Netherlands. And other countries like Romania or Poland, this afforestation was always in hand with uh, uh, agricultural policies. So, but still, afforestation and plantation still remains very controversial, especially on what are the criteria to select which species, and especially in places as well like uh, Mediterranean countries, where uh, because of land ab abandonment, uh, the, the, the forest surface has been increasing a lot in the past decades. So in these terms, also some interviewees were uh, like saying if we are giving the right message in this kind of context uh, where uh, afforestation probably it's and plantation it's not a priority because uh, the problem precisely might be uh, the opposite so also in terms of sharing information on best climate uh, practice that it uh, was a recurrent, a lot of measures were on, on this side. I think that goes speci especially in hand with uh, the outbreaks and fires and, and these threats that are, are also um, reinforced by climate change conditions. And um, a lot of countries like for instance, Germany or uh, Austria also, um, they have uh, been uh, put a lot of efforts in making knowledge exchanges. Normally these knowledge exchanges are addressed to forest managers to help them to cope better with what, uh, what, uh, what uh, these um, new events are, are bringing these threats to the, our forests. In terms of monitoring and data collection, also it was really emphasized in, in, in the previous presentation. Uh, that's interesting as well because reporting of the state of the forest was an important objective, but it was not always mentioned in documents. And maybe also that it's because a lot of countries rely in a very established systems of inventories. Um, and here, 
might be a mismatch on what type of data these inventories can provide. A lot of um, for public officers actually were expressing their worry that uh, the, the indicators are getting more and more complicated, but uh, the data availability, it's what it is. And sometimes they have very limited monitoring capacities. But on the other hand, uh, it's also interesting that uh, it seems like digitalization is taking uh, also more importance. But uh, most of the times, this digitalization, uh, it's done by agencies or private companies, not always uh, going hand with the public um, services in Church of Forest. But uh, yeah. And then uh, this last point, I think it's also interesting because this raising awareness, it's not part of the EU forest strategy as a such, or at, or at least not directly, but in all the policies uh, that we studied and analyzed, it was really a lot of uh, measures in, in all sectors that really wants to promote this awareness among uh, all citizens and all uh, interest groups on the importance of the forest and, and forest management. And we, and, and, and in the EU forest strategy, what it's really emphasized is that um, yeah, citizen participation might play a role as well in, in, in creating this awareness. Uh, the last big block of participation and stakeholder engagement, it's also promoted by the EU forest strategy, what we found is that at the moment that in, in, in many countries that has been done mainly through national forest programs and dialogue processes, it was also interesting to observe that not in all the countries, uh, these national programs um, um, were implemented. And also some interviews were reporting that especially small scale forest owners and groups that are representing the cultural services sometimes are insufficiently included in decision making in, 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 process, at, in process at the national level. So here forest management planning and consultation, it's uh, mostly the way to integrate uh, uh, citizens' opinions and interests as regards forest, and that it's also done in different, many different ways. So it comes from uh, really binding obligations, uh, uh, especially if you have to undertake forest management in a protected area like Natura 2000, you have to deliver a, a, a environmental impact assessment. And uh, in other countries, yeah, people was reporting that sometimes uh, it's not really included. And sometimes it just goes to the scale of the forest owner uh, managing their land. Here there is communication with the forest owner and the public ser services, but uh, just at that level. Yeah. So what we saw at the first part was these measures, the how, but these measures are also determined by what, what it's really prioritized in these countries. And prioritization, it's something that it's happened at political level, it's a political choice. And what we saw is that all um, members, uh, multifunctionality, it's really a political aim. So like uh, with different emphasis in, in, in different, different countries. So for instance, in some countries that should be achieved uh, by resolving tensions between forest owners and um, public administrations that uh, they have different, might have different goals. Um, yeah, and then we saw as well that despite the importance of these cultural services, not in the even in the forest strategy and, and not also in the national level strategies we analyzed this it's a priority in many countries it's always a debate between ecological aims and productive aims but these social dimensions sometimes are undermined 
finally, also we saw that a very important goal in many countries is this securing this rural development, especially to about the population, and, and that it's especially important in the south and the east. But nevertheless, uh, by economy as a such, it's uh, getting more and more salient, even in countries that uh, normally, um, yeah, they, they, they were focusing more on rural development and not really on industry, really able to provide all these new services and added value products. We saw as well the adaptation to changing environmental conditions. It's getting uh, salient in all countries. I think uh, also from the study that uh, it's associated with public opinion. So like people, it's uh, getting worried and especially because media uh, normally only talk about forests or, or, or talks more about forests just to show sometimes uh, disasters as fires and outbreaks and that in a way makes uh, forest si silence and, and important to, to bring it up to the political agenda. So that was also an important finding. And we saw that climate goals and the role of forest in green trans transition, it's also a leverage point for dialogue, but it's uh, being more relevant in countries that already are uh, contributing to the forest economy and the economy um, through forest in a, in a great uh, manner, or they want to incre inc increase their forest cover. We saw that planting trees and increasing tree cover, it's not always a priority, especially in countries uh, where um, forest surface is in in incrementing a lot. And uh, increasing participation, it's a priority. Sometimes in, in, it's in countries that they have uh, the lower uh, surface cover. And in a way also we found as a, a general rule that there is not enough uh, conflict resolution mechanism and transparency on provide a scientific input on uh, what are the different trade-offs that different management system, systems could imply in practice when we talk about forest. So based on these results, I now will summarize very briefly uh, nine uh, key recommendations that uh, we give for uh, increasing the overall forest governance in Europe, which is a big word. <laughs> but uh, as you see, we have a lot of objectives in that are being promoted, but these objectives maybe uh, they need to be agreed and they need to be. You, you, we need to bring the context on these objectives. What what that objectives will imply in all these different countries? Because in a way. Uh, we have all a range of diversity in forest settings and we have to respect these forestry settings. And that uh, applies at national level, but also at subnational level. So for instance, in the, in the study regions in Spain show that there are many differences also within a country and, and that it's important if these regions also hold competencies on forest and the laws are developed by these regions. We saw as well that uh, it's important to involve a diversity of voices and in, to include the society at, at large. I think we are still in a phase of uh, raising awareness, but probably also new mechanism need, needs to be put in place uh, to increase uh, these other voices. And this mechanism sometimes also can imply new knowledge generation and new way to communicate about what are uh, the impacts of different types of forest management and what are the limits that we, we want as a society. And that uh, also sometimes policy, um, it's clear that without uh, economic incentives that also support measures uh, related to biodiversity conservation or growth forest, um, it will be harder to implement such uh, actions and measures. 
and the climate change. And uh, it's a leverage point that really can bring the interest of many groups in forests. So it's a good opportunity to enhance the dialogue um, along the discussion about climate change. Because at the end of the day, what we also want also through all this monitoring is to improve the information on what are these policy impacts and how to adapt policies uh, that uh, have a larger impact in all senses, in economic, but also uh, environmental and social. And uh, also we recommend that this kind of cross-country dialogue or, or, or analysis are, are done because I think uh, it gives you a holistic uh, view on what is going on in different countries and you can definitely learn from each other and to establish also um, baselines. And in general, I think um, that, that it's a kind of a basic principle of forest governance. It's that we need to increase this transparency of policy making at all levels. And I think that's all on for my side, just to announce um, the content of the report. It's, uh, well, the chapters you see. Uh, also, there is an acknowledgement of these uh, 16 authors that have been helping in, in the empirical um, setting in their countries. And a big thanks also to Helga Pultz and all the AFI team, also the two reviewers that uh, help us to improve a lot the first manuscript and to the AFI Policy Support Trust Fund. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mireya. Um, could I please ask you to close? Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation and giving us first insight into this study. Uh, Sab might want to know now, when is the study available so we can read all the details? It will still need a little bit of time. So uh, please allow us a few weeks uh, to finalize it. And then we will, of course, share it with all of you once it is ready. But uh, I would like to also single out that uh, what we have learned today is we learned that there's different patterns uh, in this uh, 15, uh, 15 European countries. Um, uh, it is uh, the study that Maria has now um, presented is not an implementation study. It's basically studies the goals, how they are met, uh, how the forest strategy goals are met at the national country. Um, and to a certain extent also regional because there's three regions in Spain that were studied more um, in depth. Um, but what it clearly identified is commonalities, but also differences. And I think uh, this is very interesting um, to read more about. But now we would like to proceed in the program. And I'm very happy to give the floor to our Think Forest president, Janis Potocznik. Uh, he will chair now the panel on um, implementing the forest strategy, opportunities and challenges. Janis, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helga. And uh, dear friends, it's good to be with you, with all of 137 online and with the rest which are in the panel. Uh, I will a bit abuse the position which I have and uh, do a bit of introduction which goes a bit beyond the forests but it's pretty much connected to the forests uh, you have heard from me uh, many times that uh, according to international resource panel which is a science policy interface in the area of natural resources which i do co-chair with isabella teixeira resource use it's at the roots of the triple planetary crisis so resource extraction and processing of materials everything extracted from the earth including of course biomass metals non-metallic minerals and fossil fuels drive 90 percent of land related biodiversity loss and uh, approximately the same amount of water stress 50 percent of greenhouse gas emissions and one third of the health related uh, pollution impacts and the trends are alarming so global material use has more than tripled since 1970 and it's predicted to double by 2060 if current trends would of course continue so no need to say that forests are one of the critical natural resources and part of the essential biomass for our life and existence 
for the introduction and the lead to the panel debate. By the way, uh, the presentation uh, from Miria was really uh, nice, uh, nice uh, setting the scene. And uh, uh, I have actually decided to share with you some of the methodological novelties uh, which we will be presenting in the incoming Global Resource Outlook 2024. Uh, it will be released at UNIA 6 in the early spring next year. Eva knows it well since she's the member of the IRP. Uh, but I guess it's important for all of us uh, uh, so that we align around the major shifts needed to unpack and solve some of the challenges we face. So what we aim is to unpack in the first place the how. So how is the resource yours delivering well-being? How can we optimize that delivery? In a what way we can minimize environmental impacts in as equitable and fair way as it's possible? How can we, for example, optimize resource use for a just energy transition, which was also uh, mentioned, uh, the role, for example, of the biomass in the energy transition, which is, I think, extremely important question also for discussion, which we have. Thinking of key characteristics of the transition for the future we want, we have identified some of the core principles which will shape the GROW24 approach. And these five principles are measuring what matters, so broadening measures of progress beyond GDP to capture the real human well-being, balancing resource use to meet human development targets equitably for all, integrating resources into global sustainability and environmental agendas, in particularly in climate and biodiversity, informing decision-making through science-based, inclusive, transparent, accessible data, and finally, including the whole value chain approach. So strengthening the institutionalization and management of resources across the value chain. We will do that in a few novel ways. The first and probably most important novelty introduced will be looking at the resource use through provisioning systems. So through systems delivering essential human needs. We must shift away from the prevailing resource wasteful economic approach on maximize, based on maximizing the output of the sectors, simplistically defined by GDP or GMP towards an economy that is effectively meeting human needs and optimizing human well-being. The current logic is both ethically and ecologically unsustainable. So the five systems we will be focusing are food and nutrition, the built environment, mobility, water and sanitation, and energy, and analysis on the trends of resource use and their impacts show us that these, uh, which we have choose present around 70% of the climate impacts related to material extraction, processing use, in the downstream of economy steaming from the from those systems. This would also allow and incentivize the cross-sectoral innovation and shifts to a more future fit business models, leading to the reduction of resource use in the first place and delivering multiple benefits for planet and people. So the question which we want to ask is, and which is practically never on the political agenda, it's how to meet human needs in the most resource and energy efficient way. How can we use less resources and less energy to meet the human needs in effective way? The second novelty will be a strong focus on equity and justice issues through demand side measures and consumption. Global impacts on climate, biodiversity and pollution continue to increase. High income countries have benefited most and uh, have driven the planetary crisis while emerging and developing countries hold least responsibility and are facing, as you know, worst impacts. The World Inequality Lab in a recently published report showed that the top 10% of global emitters are responsible for approximately 50% of global carbon emissions. This is not only a just country level story, it is the highest consumer story everywhere who are responsible. The third novelty are modeling scenarios. For the first time, we will be capturing also a system change dimension. So we have added to the historic trend scenario and the context scenario, which is actually exploring the likely future if we pursue current policies and with a raised ambition on the supply side. We have added additional scenario, the sustainability one, which explores sustainable path for global resource use 
if we would do that in a systemic shift to provisioning systems from both supply and demand side. And finally, in the responses chapter, major tools will be analyzed again, both on the supply as well as on the demand side. We need multilateral agreement on how to institutionalize resource use in our systems of governance, finance, trade, and across businesses. I could go into detail, but uh, I will not. So in summary, GROW24 will provide strong scientific rationale on the imperative for high-income countries to absolutely reduce their consumption, while low- and middle-income countries grow their, theirs to meet essential human needs, but in ways to build resili resilience and minimize the future harms. So by using a provisioning system approach, we can shape a world where needs are more equitably delivered, while our dependence on materials, including critical raw materials in energy transition, which is quite popular theme today, it's minimized. Ultimately, the approach will enable us to build a more just and resilient world. So we need to move from an extraction-based production to a circular creation-based production. We should stop stimulating extraction-based economic success, rather reward responsible, innovative, creative ways of meeting human needs, and to enable an economy serving humans instead of prevailing reality, which many times, unfortunately, is putting humans in the function of economic success. So we should understand that this necessary sustainability transformation, it's not only about environmental challenges we are facing. Access to and use of natural resources have been in the human history always closely related to the level of achieved well-being by nations, but also to stability, to security, to conflicts, wars, if you want. So just think about access to land, water, oil and gas, minerals, precious metals, and I could continue. And also think about the whole history of the colonialization of nature, which was and still is so central to the fairness and equity question. The lessons learned recently, the Russian invasion, the pandemic, and one of the hottest summers again, are more than convincing to understand that. This relationship among humans and the rest of nature is simply not stable, <clears throat> nor it is balanced, and it will be either result with a collective wisdom and effort or in a hard and very painful way. So this is the choice we have when we are discussing the future and the very much needed sustainability shift. And forests. You know all about them much better than I do, actually. Forests are the lungs of the earth and are an essential natural resource. They have to be handled with care. They have to be well managed. We have heard a lot about that in the presentation. They have to be well integrated into the logic and approach I was explaining in the context of the forthcoming Global Resource Outlook 24. Adopted in 2021, the new forest strategy for 2030 for the European Union led to a renewed drive for forest policy making in Europe. Its main frame of reference, the European Green Deal, puts forests at the center of a decarbonized society to be achieved at the latest by 2050, as well as the need for carbon sequestration, biodiversity protection, forest restoration are also clearly emphasized. We see how sensitive and important those questions are also through the recent political divide happening around the nature restoration law. While the implementation of the EU forest strategy is accompanied by debates around the principle of subsidiarity competencies for forest policy, until now, there was no systemic scientific assessment which was available. So, uh, which is exactly a good reason uh, which gathered us today and the presentation which we have heard. So we will discuss the following questions. How are the forest strategy goals met at the national and subnational levels across different countries? How well and to what extent do the national and subnational forest policies of the European countries align with the European Union goals? And what are the opportunities and challenges for enhanced implementation? So to try to move a bit beyond the presentation, which was actually delivering the facts of uh, where we are, and try to unpack a bit also the questions, which is what is more impactful, where we can achieve, uh, where actually more coordination or better alignment is needed and which policies are actually better and more, uh, more efficient than the others. 
Let me introduce uh, to you the key speakers. We have three. First, Senator Pipa Hackett. It's the Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine with special responsibility for land use and biodiversity in Ireland. She was appointed to this role in June 2020. Pipa was selected to the agricultural panel of the Senate Iran in by-election on 1st November 2019 and re-elected in 2020. Pipa holds a PhD from University of Limerick. She's former member of the Offaly Country Council. Jonut Surin Banchu is a Secretary of State for European Affairs and International Relations within the Ministry of Environment, Waters and Forests in Romania. He was appointed in March 2021. In this role, he coordinates the development of Romania's positions within the European Union on all policy dossiers related to Green Deal under the responsibility of the Minister of Environment, Waters, and forests. He's actively involved, among others, in forest biodiversity and climate-related policy dossiers at the European as well as global level. And finally, my good friend and collaborator in the International Resource Panel, Professor Eva Primer. She is a research director at the Finnish Environment Institute. As a researcher, she has studied policy instruments and implementation, institutions and governance of ecosystem services, biodiversity, forests, natural resources, energy, and sustainable development. Her research work has been carried out in projects ranging from short evaluations to multi-year large collaborations financed by the European Union, the Academy of Finland, and Finnish ministries. As mentioned, she is the member of the UN IRP and also Forest Finnish, Finnish Forest Council. So welcome everybody. My main objective of the panel is to discuss opportunities and challenges for enhanced implementation of the EU forest strategy, how to strengthen collaboration between countries and region, establish a stronger dialogue between countries, scientists, society at large. I'm pretty sure we will hear many interesting and also useful thoughts. So off we go. Let me start with the first round of questions related to challenges and experiences for an enhanced implementation of the EU forest strategy. Pipa, if you would allow, I would start with you. And uh, the question which I would like to ask you is, how are the European Union forest strategy goal met in Ireland? And where do you see the biggest challenges for the implementation at the national level? Pipa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Yanis. I hope you can hear me okay. Can you hear me I'm all right? You. I'm hearing you very well. Welcome. No. Ah. Let's see. I don't see you, but I hear you very well. No, you can hear us, can you? You can hear me okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. That's good. Sorry, apologies. I can see you. Um, look, just thank you for the introduction and just say that it's it's great to great to be here and great to um delighted to, to be at the event. I think the Think Forests event are really you know progressive and proactive and um I look forward to the panel debate ahead. Um, so, as you said, I am the Minister with responsibility for land use and biodiversity, but also I'm the responsible Minister for Forestry as a standalone as well in, in my country. Um, and I suppose, firstly, at the outset, it's important to say that Ireland welcomed the EU forest strategy. Um, we rely a lot on, on strong um, EU direction um, and guidance, and this helps us in our... In our so I, I would feel that the EU strategy... Is I think when it comes to challenges in Ireland, one of our, I suppose, our most significant challenge is that we need more trees. Um, people will be aware that Ireland is one of the poorest um, afforested uh, countries in Europe. We're only at about 11 percent of afforested land, um, and we have ambitions to stretch that to 18 percent, you know, by 2050, hopefully. And so that's a big challenge to us to get get um, trees in the ground. Most of the land in Ireland is owned by private um, landowners, by farmers, about two thirds of the land. So we're almost wholly reliant on, on private landowners to, to help us meet those, those targets. So that's a, a challenge. Um, another challenge is probably some legacy issues in Ireland. Um, we have a relatively young um, forest estate, um, you know, average tree age is 
forest stands are maybe 30 or 40 years old. We don't have, um, we don't have say a cultural um, connection with forestry in the same way that other EU countries have. So it's a big challenge for farmers to think about planting trees. Um, but in the past, we've, we've, we've legacy issues in terms of we planted trees in the wrong place. Um, and that has had knock on negative effects for, for water quality, for, for habitats, for communities. And we're very much trying to, I suppose, deal with that as well as try to drive on forwards with a, an ambitious, um, environmentally friendly, if you like, model of forestry. So those are those are sort of the, some of the challenges. And I suppose how we've tried to address this um, over the past year or so, we've engaged um, and consulted widely, not only with our citizens of Ireland, but also with the key stakeholders across the board. So from forest, the forest industry side to the NGO side and everyone in between, um, we've, we've come up with a, a vision, a shared national vision out to 2050 for Ireland. Um, and that was published, I published that last October. Um, this vision now has, has led to the development of our new national forest strategy, um, which I hope to publish shortly shortly, and that will set out um, key objectives, uh, key goals and key actions to set us on this right path. And I suppose the final part of that is the development of a, a new forestry programme, which sees us out to 2027. And this is the main implementation mechanism um, by which we support and incentivize those valuable landowners to engage with forestry and to plant trees. Um, that's a massive package of 1.3 billion euros, which is supported from from the state um, exchequer um, we're waiting to we're working closely with the um, commission to, to um, obtain the state aid approval for that big spend um, and as soon as that approval comes through we will be able to engage with landowners to, to support them and encourage them to plant trees um, so I think that, that while there are a number of challenges um, the opportunities are great. We are already anecdotally seeing a lot of evidence from landowners to engage in tree planting. And of course, we all know the trees and the forests of the future have to deliver across so many um, issues, as you say, not only from climate action, but from biodiversity, from amenity and community values. Uh, timber production, we can't forget about that and, um, you know, and the job. So I think we have this opportunity to move forward. Um, and, you know, I would love to flash forward in 20 years time and, and see what we achieve, but fingers crossed, uh, you know, we will be making strides in the right direction in the next couple of years. Thank you, Pippa. Um, it's actually amazing if uh, somebody who is representing the country, which is known as 40 shades of gray, of sorry, of, of green, it's, uh, it's starting with, uh, we, we need more forests. But uh, obviously that green is a bit missing in among your greens, uh, but uh, it's, it's very interesting to see that. But anyway, uh, let me continue with Jonut, uh, uh, Jonut, Romania recently approved the new forest strategy 2030 following a long consultation process. How did the EU forest strategy impact the discussions surrounding the national forest strategy? And what were the challenges in this process? Jonut, please. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. I think uh, what is also important that I mentioned, I, I, have, rec I have been recently awarded uh, taking care of the forestry sector in Romania. So we have changed the minister uh, a few days ago. I'm also a forester by education, and I'm, I'm proud to represent the forest sector as well in this discussion. Uh, of course, um, um, we have uh, been very lucky. Uh, we have been um, um, implementing a very good consultation process to develop and approve the national forest strategy right on time, I would say, because it was just after the European forest strategy, the European biodiversity strategy, and also big parts of the uh, FIT for 55 of the Green Deal were already approved. So we were in a very fortunate position to align the priorities with the, Euro the national priorities with the European, uh, with the U European ones. Uh, we have also been lucky to have this uh, included in the National Recovery and Z Resilience Plan. So we have uh, significant funds for what will be 
what will be the, the main objectives in the new national forest strategy. Uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan uh, contains investments in more than 830 million euro in new forests, but also in, in uh, flood control, also in nurseries and so on. Because even if we are a country rich in forests, about 7 million hectares of forest, we still have areas and regions where forests are lacking. And we are struggling to convince also farmers, like Pippa said, to, to plant more trees and put the discussion into their terms because the agricultural productivity, the agriculture resilience to climate change will be improved by planting more trees and having more trees in, in the agricultural lands. I think uh, in Romania, one of our challenges is um, to enhance trust uh, of our society into the foresters. I always tell my colleagues that forests do not belong to foresters anymore. They belong to the entire society. And if the society does not or seems not to understand the role of forest, then for who are we doing these services? And this is a very relevant question, not only in Romania, but I have been discussing it with uh, my colleagues all over Europe. Uh, would... Uh, we need to talk about wood as a resource, um, a sustainable resource, a, re a renewable resource, and not see it as the devil. Uh, you know, we, in Romania, because of the challenges we have with, with the legal logging, uh, a big part of the society considers wood as a bad material. And we need to, we need to change this because we all know uh, a lot of communities are still dependent on, on firewood, but not only on, on, uh, uh, on wood as a resource, other uh, non-wood forest products, but also jobs. Uh, because even if we are not in the situation of having the, the villages abandoned by people, we, we are still uh, in this risk too. So uh, for us, uh, it is an important moment. I think uh, I consider it the National Forest Strategy. It was a project that I have coordinated at the last stages. We have a governmental decision that approved it. Uh, we have a plan to have more than 60,000 hectares of new forest by 2030, and also the uh, dedicated funds to do it. In the same time, we are about to finalize Fortunately, Yonut, I think we have lost the connection. So if so you are, sorry. yeah, we are getting you back. We have just lost you for uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I, I just wanted to mention that we are currently in the process of finalizing the, a new forest act, uh, like a societal pact between the society and the forest managers to um, um, try to put all these words like forest ecosystem services, uh, the roads of forest nearby big cities into practice and to, and to balance all these societal needs that are new and have been developed uh, in the last 20 years and put them on paper in this, uh, let's say, national agreement on what we do with our forests for the future. That's... Absolutely needed, and I think you have very nicely explained uh, one of the magic of uh, policy making, not only in the forest, so establishing the trust, because that's uh, the magical word in how the things actually start to work and how they are better understood. But uh, let me go uh, finally in this first round to Eva. And uh, Eva, I would just like to ask you a question. How do you see that uh, research and scientists are hurt in the national regional implementation process of this EU forest strategy. Are you listened enough or what would be necessary that this could improve? Thank you, Janice. A good question. And, and thank you to Pippa and Jonas for your for your um inputs. It puts also my, like me thinking of Finland in in, in new ways. Um, because we have this huge legacy of forest policy and, and forestry and forest management. We have a lot of trees, but the trees are not very big because we manage our forests so efficiently. So in, in some way, we have a very strong in, institutional foundation. But but if I first ask, uh, answer Janice's question, and then maybe if I have time, tell a little bit more about the Finnish uh, forest strategy. So I would say that all these issues, whether they are national forest policy issues or um, European level, they are very science driven. So the, the 
policy goals that we set in the strategies are extremely science driven. So if it is biodiversity, climate change, um, restoration uh, as more active or adaptation as more active viewpoints or more technological aspects of forest management um, and the value chain, these all have a lot of science as a foundation for when these strategies have been prepared in the background. And then this preparation comes to a bit more political um, stage where there is a lot of compromise and, um, and this comes, becomes public and there's a lot of interests being negotiated. And at this point, it can start to look that was science used at all? Because a lot of these interest um, groups and, and politicians, active voices in the society, draw onto specific research results and say, this has not been respected, this, is, this has been ignored, and not um, kind of like paying hmm, attention or, or acknowledging how, it, how the whole strategy is quite all encompassing. And so um, this happens in Finland, this happens at the EU level. <laughs> and, and I think that um, what, what uh, we see then is that the, this really needs to be strengthened, this science policy interface, so that it is also um, apparent for those who comment on policy, how science has been used, because there is a lot of science that is being used. And also the presentation by Mireya, that is also science, <laughs> that also uses methods that are, are scientifically reviewed and, and so on. So, so we should um, acknowledge that there is a lot of research happening here. Um, so um, I think that what we need in some way, we, have, we need even more multidisciplinary work to avoid this picking somehow particular results about value added or um, carbon balance or biodiversity, but so that the multidisciplinarity becomes more apparent also in the, in the public debate. So the Finnish forest strategy, I, I thought that I would just say briefly about the Finnish forest strategy, how, how that has been prepared and how, um, how, what kind of emphasis it has. So it has been prepared in, um, in collaboration with a lot of stakeholders, a, a lot of like participatory rounds, and then there is a lot of expert input into it as well. And, um, and it takes um, growth and welfare to the center stage and, and perhaps even plays with words. So growth, you can think of forest growth or economic growth, but then all, but welfare is at the center stage. And then it has um, um, emphasis on, on value added, um, competitiveness, responsibility, and also active management with a, an approach that we would diversify our management regimes and, and what, which this has only just started in Finland. So we have had a fairly like clear rotation with thinnings and, and clear cuts. And this has resulted in fairly monotonous forest structure in some way. So there is uh, added um, emphasis on, on continuous growth, on um, diversifying the species structure. We don't have very many native species, but we could, we could use those species more. And this, these are increasing trends, we see them from the statistics, but then the forest um, strategy puts emphasis on this as well. And on vitality, health and biodiversity of forests, and then very much on um, knowledge-based management and increasing competence. So, so both uh, kind of uh, increasing skills in the forest sector and then using our digital tools more. So perhaps I, I leave it there so that there is <laughs> time to discuss more, more topics. Thanks. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, uh, you have very well described uh, uh, the situation, which is uh, the relation between science and the policymaking. So you would hardly find in, among policymakers anybody who would be against basing the decisions of policymakers on knowledge and scientific work. But of course, uh, in reality, um, uh, people are really trying to choose that parts of the science which are pretty much fitting their own uh, in advance already uh, determined interests. So a bit of fundamental honesty in using the science would sometimes help. Anyway, uh, this is a bigger question which we will not solve today, but uh, I think it's important that, uh, that we are aware that it's existing and that it is part of the problems. Uh, 
which leads me now to the second round of the questions, uh, which are centered around the opportunities of how to strengthen and enhance the implementation of the European Union forest strategy. So uh, if you would allow me, Yundut, I would start uh, now with you with a question, uh, which is how does your country deal with synergies and trade-offs when implementing some of the targets of the new European Union forest strategy? Or for example, how do you see the trade-offs between wood production on one hand and biodiversity conservation on the other hand, especially in Romania, with high value conservation forests. Please. You want to... Yes, thank you. I think um, it's not only the European forest strategy that we will need to implement through our national forest policies, but also the EU biodiversity strategy, uh, renewable energy directive, uh, the climate policies, and so many others. And this only there are only a few European policies or trends that show how important uh, the forest strategies or the forest policies are in the current world. Uh, for us uh, at the Ministry of Environment and Forest, we are again in a fortunate situation, and sorry to use fortunate so many times, but we are dealing with the forestry sector as an industrial sector, uh, community uh, driven as well, but also with the biodiversity. So we have to have all the angles. And I think what is important still for the Roma for the Romanian forest sector is the social aspects, because in Romania we still have millions of people that are dependent on forests in in such direct ways. And this is why we have created a new definition in our forest act: uh, communities that are highly dependent on forests. And we will have to define um, dedicated, I would say, policies to ensure that. They, are, um, uh, they will continue to, to use their forest in a sustainable way. And we have the examples of today. We have so many old growth forests in Romania still. More than 70,000 hectares are identified, mapped, and protected by national legislation. We have beautiful national parks. We have millions of hectares of forest habitats which are in, in good conservation status with all the challenges you all know. Uh, uh, it Of course, it will be a challenge to balance all these needs, but I think we are wise enough to balance all this. Romania has enough forests to fulfill all these objectives, including the one of the most important, the, the climate mitigation potential. So we, we are, Romanian forests are still more stable, more resilient than others because we have succeeded to, to use the natural type of forests and mixed stands and long production cycles and what uh, um, foresters in Europe, or, or Europe are calling now closer to nature forestry. So I think um, uh, as a paradox to what you hear about the, uh, the illegal logging and the things that are, are still a challenge in Romania, uh, we need to preserve the good practices and update the forest policies to include the social dimension, the cultural dimension, and also this new trend of, of recreational forest uh, in big cities. And just a, a new a recent example in Bucharesti, there was a new law that is almost adopted to protect all forests in the whole county uh, of uh, Ilfov that is surrounding Bucharest. And I think we need to have the discussion more and more. What are the roads of forests nearby big cities, especially in areas where forests are not so, so predominant? And, uh, uh, and, and also to put a real value on these services that forests offer that are not very well uh, put into, let's say, the financial balances. And, and also make our societies understand that protecting some forests that belong to private owners comes with the costs that, of course, the society has to pay in some ways, uh, and also to, to see forests in so different perspectives, the ones that are uh, in big cities that have a fundamentally different role, and the ones in the rural landscapes of Romania that have a total different role. So we are we are in a very delicate situation. Uh, we are there to balance all these different needs, uh, and fortunately, we are in the Ministry of Environment. So forests are taken care of by the Ministry of Environment. So by, uh, I would say, uh, uh, a legal duty, we need to take care of all these aspects. So the conflicts between 
the traditional foresters and the, uh, let's say, uh, environmental NGOs are better managed, I would say, or should be better managed, not to say too much. Yeah, thank you. thank you. You have opened at least three things I would like to comment. Uh, by the way, I know very well this suspicion to the Ministry of Environment, uh, but uh, what is an interesting thing if you are working uh, in that ministry is that uh, you are pretty much responsible for all the problems while the solutions are pretty much in the hands of your colleagues. So it's difficult basically to put those two things together. So you have to be friend with many people, I would put it like that, and you have to persuade many how the things are important and uh, step into their shoes also. The second thing which I would also like to comment, it's uh, this unfortunate uh, reality, which I think we all see and understand that if we receive something for free, we simply don't value it as long as, uh, as, long as we don't start losing it. When we start losing it, then we start valuing it much better. And again, how to get that uh, understanding uh, that this is extremely uh, important and valuable for our quality of life nowadays, it's uh, very important. And the last comment, which I would like to do on what you have said, it's um, this, that was your first call about uh, the importance of uh, more holistic approach and not looking through the too narrow silo logic, which many times, because you mentioned a lot of the a uh, lot of the legislative pieces which are prepared and actually have uh, impact on the on the forests and and uh, the question is how well they are coordinated and uh, uh, i am for example very much trying to underline that uh, while of course fight against climate change is the ultimate fight which we which we have to have on our agenda uh, you have two strategies. One is achieving that for whatever it will cost, which is not a good agenda, or with a minimum cost. So taking into account also all the questions which are related to uh, social, cultural aspects, biodiversity aspects, and so on. Which are, uh, So we should avoid the conflicting results of the policies with good intentions. And uh, I think this is a pretty serious challenge, uh, which we are all facing and uh, and i think uh, you are absolutely right and we have also learned anybody who was in policy making learned that uh, something which is not acceptable it's not acceptable so you have to make it acceptable and even if it makes common sense and, and uh, people don't see it acceptable i firmly believe by the way that that uh, that sustainability environmental sustainability transition without simultaneously also having more social equity transition it's simply uh, it's simply uh, unfortunately it will not succeed so it we need to do it hand in hand because uh, it is uh, it is extremely important that we understand that that uh, the things are connected and these are not two two different and not not connected stories but i was a bit long uh, anyway uh, uh, which obviously means that your answer was quite uh, thought provoking and good uh, which leads me to you, Pippa, again. Um, one of the European Union goals, including in the European Union forest strategy, it's also to increase the forest cover to also enhance the forest sink. So how to deal with potential conflicting objectives between forest cover expansion and agricultural land? So can you share some of the insights from, from uh, Ireland perspective, please? Yes, I can. And it's actually a very good question because it's, it's, it's quite a significant challenge in Ireland, because as I said, we're, we've got a low level of afforestation as it is. We don't have a very strong cultural connection with forestry. So uh, there, are, there are people in Ireland who see forestry as a step backwards. If you convert your, your uh, farmland to forestry, it's, it's seen as a, a, a retrograde step, that this isn't something that you should be doing. It's almost the total opposite in, um, in Finland. Finland, I understand that you're not considered a farmer 
or unless you have some forestry where here it's like it's considered by some not by all um so that, there's that challenge there's that sort of pressure that comes on farmers who are thinking about it um look i'm a farmer myself and we have a small bit of woodland on our farm and i can i can i, I remember when we planted it it's only maybe 10 or 12 years old you know the neighbors were saying oh you're planting trees are you mm, well you know and there was a little bit of you know even from our our neighbors so it's, it's an interesting dynamic and that's across all of ireland i suppose the challenge as well um in in this regard is that ireland is quite a well every country is unique in their own right but ireland's uniqueness um in terms of planting forestry is that it has a lot of um hydrological connections it has a lot of it's quite wet everywhere as anyone would expect in ireland um there's challenges about the right sites for forestry never mind getting farmers on board so that that that's a a uh, difficulty for us. So I suppose that's why we've really um, worked hard to, to get um, the, 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 the citizens of Ireland and the stakeholders on board with a, with a, a, a vision for forestry, um, as I said, with a strategy um, soon to be published on that. And then with the, if you like, the money and the incentives to encourage farmers to make that step and to diversify. And in, in some cases, it's, it's, it's a no brainer for forestries in terms of farm income, because the, the rewards and the incentives are, are way greater, much greater than what they would be earning for, from the land, you know, certainly for the next two decades, if not beyond. Um, so again, it's that it's that mindset shift we need to see uh, across the board in, in farmers. Um, I think also, uh, you know, supporting them with with knowledge transfer and I suppose peer to peer learning is really important too. farmers seem to, you know, they don't want to hear the government telling them what to do or, mm -hmm. or, or, or interest groups, they want to hear from from another farmer that it has worked for them. And I suppose we, we have tried to broaden the support base for, for, for planting all sorts of different types of, of forestry models. Um, I suppose at the moment, I suppose historically that the commercial side was always the most attractive and it was it was well supported, but we know we've seen, you know, some of the, the challenges with that in terms of environmental um, damage in certain parts of the country. So we certainly have tried to um, put put incentives into, you know, more native tree planting. We support now continued cover planting. Um, I think there's a big scope in Ireland for, for um, something like agroforestry, where, where farmers can farm alongside trees. And that might be a good way to get farmers interested in tree planting. And we, we've increased the supports across the board for all types of tree planting. Um, so, I mean, the incentives are there. I suppose that the, the trade off there is still there in terms of the, the agricultural land versus forestry. So I think we need to bring forward a vision that forestry is part of agriculture here. Forestry is part of land and farm management in Ireland, and it shouldn't be seen as sort of an either or, or that one thing is losing out from another. And that, that's probably a, a quite a big challenge for us to, to work to that. But we have some really positive and proactive um, forest owners in Ireland, you know, and they're best suited really to, to share that information and, and to get out and about. And, and we need to utilize them, you know, certainly from a policy perspective to, to, to get out and to show what it means to have a forest and you know what what joy it can bring to people um because it can bring joy and there's so much walk you know whether you're walking around your your stand of trees or walking among your cattle you know the the, the joy is is good too and that's important that emotive connection with forestry we need to really look at at, at growing that and building that. But certainly we have been looking at, um, we have a very, I suppose, robust and onerous regulatory system here in terms of getting a license to plant forestry. I mean, it has been criticized by, by farmers, by the sector, um, by, by many stakeholders. Now we have reviewed it, um, it aligns with um, EU directives, um, but I think because of our relatively unique landscape and because we're trying to afforest the whole time, it's not just manage what we have, it's grow that area um, it, it, it's been, a, 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 I suppose, a, a, an area of contention for, for farmers as well. And a lot have said, oh, it's too much effort. Uh, it takes too long. Why would I bother? And we, we, you know, we have improved the system. We need to continue to improve that regulatory system um, and continue that engagement, I think, with farmers and other landowners and, and certainly the public as well. So uh, it sounds like there's an awful lot to do. And, and in a way there is, but we've done an awful lot in the last couple of years to, to you know, to, to 
sell it, I think, and to, to paint a picture of what it can look like. And I suppose um, that's what we need to do. I think I think Abe is right about the, the multidisciplinary approach needed because we can get caught up just talking about climate action. Um, and then all of a sudden that, you know, then we're talking about maybe biodiversity or maybe we're talking about water or maybe we're talking about habitats or we're talking about a species of bird. And you get so broken up um, and it's almost impossible sometimes to see where the where the balance is. Unfortunately, there are going to have to be trade offs. So we meet, need to make those as minimal as possible, I suppose, for any particular reason or any particular aspect. And um, part of that, that's part of the mature conversation we need to have around it, that, that people accept, look, there will be trade offs, but we will absolutely do our best to minimize those in, in any particular any particular facet of this, this multidisciplinary uh, thing that is forestry, because it really is. Fascinating story. Um, it's and and uh, really uh, quite interesting, in particular from point of view that uh, I will try to explain it. Uh, that actually people in the cities better understand that that actually that people in the farm how important the the trees nowadays are. Uh, we'll we'll try to elaborate that. Um, um, it's uh, basically. Climate change is really changing our lives. So uh, I'm old enough to say that in my youth, the amount of extreme days was during the summer the same as it's the amount of normal days now. So it's just upside down. And uh, yesterday, uh, I'm currently situated in Belgium and uh, yesterday was terribly hot day. So it was 35 plus. And uh, if you're in the city where the which has a lot of uh, forest covers cover, then you you pretty quickly understand that that city has some two, three, four degrees lower average temperature than the cities which are the opposite. But even in that kind of city, it's still very hot. So the solution is very simple. You have to go out and walk in the forest because there it's where it's the only bearable day. And if you are walking in the forest, of course, you walk under the trees, which are older, with a more rich uh, leaves cover, and uh, which gives you much more solid shadow, if I can put it like that, which again gives you a very quick recognition what the forests are and what type of forests are actually giving us the, the most of the protection. And uh, finally, I went from there to the restaurant which was, uh, of course, having, which was located nicely. So part of the restaurant was artificial shadow and part of the restaurant was under two, three uh, solid trees. And I was first sitting under the artificial shadow, but I very quickly moved to the other shadow because the shadow of the tree is totally different than the artificial shadow. So we will not survive living in artificial shadows of the future. That's my point. And I think it's really important that we start to understand that. And it's paradoxically that sometimes uh, that, that farmers, of course, through, through their optic, which you have explained very nicely, uh, not seeing that immediately, but it is pretty much uh, the future of our lives and forests will be part of survival strategy. So, uh, which uh, leads me to the question to you, Eva, how should the role, of course, I will again mention the science and research in national and also in regional forest policy making be strengthened to meet the EU forest strategy goals and targets. How can scientists address the local levels where important decisions are made and uh, where do you think we should go there? Yes, thank you, Janis. That was nice of your, your own reflection of the sort of scares. Uh, tree-based ecosystem services that become so valuable because they are a little bit scarce and then maybe reflecting that against what Pippa was talking about and, and Jonas was talking about very much that when you have more trees or more other uses of land then when there is then you're refining what your use is and you try to extract value from from kind of the basic product and, and it's quite a different emphasis and that's what the ecosystem services uh, thinking has brought us to somehow like to brought these two aspects into comparison and the, the EU forest strategy captures this nicely and increasingly our our national strategies do that as well 
But um, we, when we think, so today we have heard a lot about the specificities and it's really nice how we have Pippas and Ayonut's um, um, personal country representations here, but also Mireya's presentation highlighted how, we, how there needs to be somehow co-learning across the different uh, um, national contexts. And, and it made me think that, well, first of all, I think that at the EU level, which also enhances national research, the EU research programs are very important. The horizon allows comparison and allows this cross, cross learning, and this should be done much more as well. But for example, I have participated in a lot of this kind of projects where we look at forest ecosystem services, forest um, biodiversity conservation policy instruments, um, innovations in, in the forest sector, and they have all included elements of comparison. And this is very important because it allows co-learning. But today I have also started to think that maybe this kind of national lessons that we hear like at the in Jonas, Jonas um input there was about the what the different administration or the different stakeholders do and in PIPAs what the landowners do that we would actually um uh, establish a little bit more co-learning processes across these actors uh, at the European level. But at the national level, co-learning is very important as well, so that we learn from each other, just like we have we heard in Pippa's input. Um, and so, like I said earlier, and I want to highlight it again, multidisciplinary research is very important so that you bring the biophysical reality and scenarios into dialogue with, uh, with uh, markets, with the social context and with innovation, uh, landowners, you have to bring these together so that you, you get like meaningful research. And another aspect that I wanted, want, really want to highlight is empirical analysis of policy, both policy design and policy implementation, so that it doesn't become anecdotal and political what we say about how policies function, what kind of mechanisms we should apply, what would be a good proposal, so that we actually have policy analysis based evidence to back up our um, policy recommendations. And that's somehow what our Think Forest today is also like promoting by the, by the study that was introduced, but we should use this in more systematic ways. And I think that also in the Horizon process, um, program, we should have more of this kind of implementation analysis that also includes and cost effectiveness, legitimacy and, and different impact analysis. Okay, then I, I already talked about the local level. So um, maybe I just say about local level, some of this cross learning, I talked about that research often applies case study um, approaches. So, so the policy analysis applies cases. For example, in Finland, we have some policy mechanisms, like we have a payment mechanism that we have studied for 20, 20 years, so two decades. So we are, we're very knowledgeable about what the implications of this mechanism is, but then also the policy uh, kind of mix becomes very apparent when you're studying a specific site or a specific setting where a new instrument is introduced. So these kind of case studies are very important, but they are also important for ecological or added value, um, like innovation and, and technological. You need case studies, but you need a systematic aggregation of the messages from this kind of cases. And you can do that also already at the national level. But ideally, when we are talking at the EU level, we would need this kind of um, approaches at the EU level. And, and that's actually where we have a lot of room for, for improvement. Indeed, Eva, we have a lot of room for improvement, uh, uh, you rightly said. I think that there needs to be a good balance between the case studies on one hand, and on the other hand, the a kind of uh, system change uh, policy, which is led by the governments, because Case studies are absolutely needed for people to understand, but on the other hand, they should not become an excuse not to do the necessary system change, uh, uh, system changes. And, uh, and when you mentioned the importance of empirical uh, policy making, one of the things which I have faced during my, uh, my political life was that I was a few times accused of being a technocrat, which I actually take uh, took uh, very very positively because my understanding of uh, technocrat versus the the true politician was that the technocrats even read and try to understand so uh, 
uh, that was not seen uh, as a kind of offense. On the contrary, I think everybody needs to be a bit of technocrat because that's exactly uh, important. It's important that you that you rely on the good knowledge that you um, have the right people around yourself, which are providing you with those things and doing you the right analysis. So, which leads me now to the to the more to the final part of our debate. Um, uh, the question which I have here in front of me is what is actually needed to address and overcome the trade-offs uh, that are inherent in the forest strategy. If you have any kind of uh, very quick, short uh, uh, points which uh, you think that it makes a lot of uh, sense and are important, I think uh, that would be valuable for everybody who is, uh, who is listening to us. So uh, would anybody like to start? Eva, maybe you, because you are not yet muted. Okay. <laughs> I'm in a quiet room, so I dare to have the microphone on. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I will still highlight the importance of multidisciplinary research that reached reaches to practice so considers also practice and, and includes policy and evaluation. Uh, so that is needed. And then we need, in addition to that, we need dialogue across the different kind of um, um, interests and types of actors. Um, you can't emphasize dialogue <laughs> uh, too much, but the, it, maybe this uh, the, the way that it should be organized so that it doesn't become eternal dialogue is so that it's organized and punctuated so that we know where the where the points of decision are. Deepa? Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think on a similar line, I think I think forests can and should be multifunctional, but they're also not all forests can deliver all functions equally, and there needs to be a sort of acknowledgement of that. I think broadly um, from across all stakeholders, um, and certainly the I suppose the types of forests established um, will result in those trade offs we've been talking about, um, and even within a forest itself. Um, and again, I suppose from an Irish perspective, um, the sort of co commercial conifer model is seen, seen as the easier, more straightforward route to forestry and it you know, obviously delivers an income in a much shorter period of time. I mean, we're growing our, our, our trees are re reaching um, maturity in 35 years. Like, I mean, it's, it, it just, they just grow like crazy here. So it's, it's seen as a viable turnaround and, uh, but saying that then, you know, establishment of more native types of woodland is considered more challenging because we we don't pay infinite you know infinitely for their establishment not yet anyway so people think oh after 15 or 20 years that's that's it, it all runs out and we don't have maybe the commercial um uh, attractiveness of them but i do think we do need to make the the commercial forestry um uh, certainly more close to nature in their management so again we're looking at things like more continuous cover maybe less clear fell model more mixed species all of those things actually that uh um you're not alluded to in the in the Romanian system, so it sounds really good. Um, but I think in Ireland we we need to get better at valuing the non wood benefits of forests, um, and certainly re rewarding um, landowners for protecting biodiversity in water. And we're, we're aspiring to do that in our new strategy and the new program. Um, we don't have a hardwood um, um, processing in Ireland. We don't. We just have softwood processing. So something to look at down the line of developing a market for hardwoods and maybe processing for that. So there is that bit, little bit of economic return from those types of forests. Um, and certainly we need to get better at developing the sort of recreational potential of forests and, and that connectivity you know to cities to have a, a forest near them or a town um, and we're, we're relatively fortunate that we have quite a diverse scattering of forests in Ireland so I think I think nobody is really more than about 10 kilometers from a forest but the access isn't always there if it's a privately owned forest we don't have a right to roam here which is which is you, you will see in other parts certainly Finland and other parts of Europe um, we don't have that here so we're quite restricted and I think one final element would be that we want certainly to see forests 
forestry to sit at the center of the sort of circular and green economy into the future um, and certainly displacing the value of the timber not only as timber but displacing carbon um, intense building um, again we're behind the curve in Ireland in that there's some wonderful examples across Europe of where you know you're allowed to go more than a certain height we're very restricted in the use of timber here and we don't even have much again of a culture Scotland has something like 80 percent of its homes are timber frame and Ireland is about 20 percent that's just timber frame never mm -hmm. mind the more um interesting glue lamb and cross laminate timber products and so forth so there's as I said still a lot to do but um I think we're making good strides and you know there's good there's a good desire to see this work so that that's that that's a positive uh you on it yes thank you again I think uh if we talk about how we should manage forests and how we balance production and protection and um, the social cultural aspects, uh, we are we are not we, we don't have so many challenges. With when you have seven million hectares of forest, you should have enough for every single, uh, um, I would say, objective secondary objective. Uh, we will need to expand strict protection in national parks. And this is one way to reach the 10 section strict protection target that the European Biodiversity Strategy comes with. Uh, expanding uh, Natura 2000 will be a challenge, but not in the land sector in Romania, but in the sea sector, uh, where we don't have uh, strict protection at all. In the same time, um, we will have to, we are still in a, in a position that we will need infrastructure, um, transport infrastructure and other types of infrastructure. And we would need to be wise enough to do it without uh, destroying habitats and with, without degrading habitats. And I think we have an experience already gathered that this uh, environmental assessment processes really need to be implemented in the proper way and evaluate the impacts on, on habitats and ecosystems in a consistent way and compensate or, uh, or mitigate these risks. When we talk about expanding the forest cover, we will have the same challenges as in Ireland because uh, we need more forest in the agricultural landscapes and this is where we need them more. We have the certification in Romania. We will need more land for renewable energy like solar and wind. We will need more land for ecological agriculture, so 25% according to the farm to fork strategy. So at some point, we'll need to decide. I'm really sure that we can't have everything on the same territory. Uh, and this is where the European level should have to take place in a very consistent way, because European targets and percentages mean nothing if you don't get it down to the country level. And we can say at one point, yes, Romania can offer more biodiversity, but please help us have also some renewable energy because uh, we can't be we we can't secure uh, the whole biodiversity of Europe because we have we are in a moment where we haven't ruined everything and we still have uh, you know beautiful landscapes and bears and wolves and old forests and so on. So uh, I think these are the difficult discussions that are not taking place honestly yet at European level, and we need to have them. We need to put all the ministers at one table and say okay. Let's put all these targets together, all of them, because no one did a cumulative impact assessment. We have so many regulations, so many targets, so many strategies. But if you put all of them together and calculate the socio-economic impacts, you will see the reality. And we, we only see patches of realities. We have estimated the cost of restoration regulation. We have estimated the cost of deforestation free. We have estimated the cost of implementing the biodiversity strategy but not all of them together. And I think this is a discussion that hasn't been taken yet and where different countries will have to come with their specificities and their uh, strengths and also uh, uh, use this as opportunities to, to, uh, to, to share these this efforts uh, in a ethical and just way. I mean, uh, just transition is not uh, only for uh, a discussion be be between the global north and the global south. It's also a discussion that needs to happen in Europe. And Romania is in a position that can understand the developing countries in the same way that it can understand also the developed countries. So um, I, I would say we have plenty of, of, of experiences to share with the rest of Europe and the world yeah. when the time will come. 
Very good points. Um, by the way, um, you have actually nicely explained uh, what could be the advantage of European Union and uh, living together. Uh, of course, if we would uh, just be able to solve some of those questions, uh, uh, really identifying where could the participation of different regions, countries could be more effective than in the other areas and where we could share then the benefits. Uh, I think uh, with that, I'm actually entering to the last question, which is more linked to the to the future generations, because you have all very well explained that, uh, in a way, uh, reaching this balance between conservation and the economic interests is at the core of the questions, which we always have to deal with it. And it's at the core of the questions also of uh, a bit more uh, short-term uh, policy making, which thinks in the first place about our current economic interests and also about longer term questions, which do take into account how we would actually not deplete uh, nature and natural capital and uh, leave uh, the world in balance also for the future generations. And this is quite a critical question. Um, I, By the way, I have heard a nice, nice um, anecdotal quote. Uh, I read it just a few days ago which is uh, nicely explaining, I would say, the, the, the current uh, trends uh, where basically our current economic system and also capitalistic way of management are leading us. Uh, uh, it is from uh, one of the famous ex-Yugoslav comics, which was called Alan Ford. And uh, the quote goes something like that. Um, it is not difficult to drive without the brakes. It is difficult to stop. So uh, that's where we are. So uh, we are sometimes driving without the brakes. So, uh, and stopping when you are driving without the brakes, it's not an easy thing. And uh, there are many of the things which we have to take and consider. So my last question to you would be actually uh, a more a kind of the answer to that young generation. Uh, what do you think should be the steps forward? How How do you think that the, forests and the forestry will look like in the middle of the century when apparently we will meet our targets. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Ooh, right. Ladies first. Okay, Pippa, we start with you. Oh, sorry, I've, I've bumped you off there, Eva. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I mean, really, I suppose that's what we're all about is what's what the whole future holds and, and, you know, for the next generations and, and for, I suppose, the, the sustainability of our planet and of Europe. I suppose I would like to answer this and to reflect on our own uh, national vision for trees and forestry out to 2050. Um, and really, I suppose the language in that, it sets out a vision that Ireland by 2050, that the, the, its forests and woodlands will be seen as a symbol of the transformational, social, economic and environmental changes that were needed to address the climate and biodiversity crisis, you know, back in the 2020s, that 30 years ago, we saw the need to transform what we view our forests to increase the level of afforestation, but do it in a way that dealt with some of those issues. Um, and while we won't have very, well, we have some mature forests in 30 years time that are planted today, but we'll be well and truly on the path of, um, of, of, of creating that model of forestry that, that does hopefully meet all the, the multifunctional fun functionalities that we expect from it. Um, so we do want to see a point in the future where our forests provide a profitable diversification option for those farmers and landowners. We're, we're almost wholly reliant on to plant the trees where people living in rural areas or in urban areas feel a sense of uh, belonging and ownership by the woodlands in their areas and the forests in their areas. And they, they you know, they, they grow up and their, their children grow up you know, feeling that's part of their, their natural environment now. Um, and certainly the, the economic side of it in terms of um, delivering for, for rural economies and, and jobs of the future, and obviously that all important circular economy, we need to see 
timber and wood of the future playing a huge role in. Um, and I suppose one thing for Ireland is that I would, you know, hopefully by 2050 or, or well before then, we want to be able to say that some of those legacy environmental issues and challenges we have, we, we are now seeing now will be a thing of the past, that we will have rectified some of those issues, that we've moved on, that we're not repeating um the the problems from the past um and i think i think it was um i think it was you know who said about um bringing along what's good you know from the past and then adapting future mm -hmm. to, to to suit what we need so i think um maybe it was yourself eva sorry um but i think that's where we need to get at um and that we have a, a diverse a resilient you know healthy trees and woods healthy communities and uh delivering all of those benefits we need for the environment society and the economy so big ask but listen we have to we have to aim high and 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 really aspire to get there indeed that's exactly what we have to do eva yes thank you i was also going to say that we will have diverse forests and forestry so that our practices will be more diversified um this is of course from finland where we have gone quite far in the uniform <laughs> path so so but this needs to be this needs to happen also at the European level. And so we would need more, more diverse actors as well in the forest sector, more diverse practices and more diverse ecosystems. And this would make our forest ecosystems more resilient um, and, and, and our practices also more adaptable. And so that learning is at the center so that we, we are doing information or knowledge driven um, decisions. Um, but also this would make our forests and our sector more resilient to external shocks, which we have experienced recently, and we will continue to experience things that we don't expect and anticipate. So the diversity increases resilience as well, and, and that's really important. Thanks, and uh, finally, uh, Jonut. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess I have the honor to, to close this panel after two uh, very well documented ladies. Uh, for me, um, it's clear that there is no future without forests. Uh, we are so connected with what offers need to offer then I can't, I can't see 2050 without forests. So um, what we need to do is to um, align policies with the societal needs. And we have seen how these societal needs have switched only in the last 20 years since I'm doing my job. And the huge interest of our society is towards forests. And uh, another thing that we need to do is to translate science to people because honestly, if they don't believe in science, in what they should, I mean, per we should avoid uh, uh, developing policies based on perception. Uh, this is as uh, uh, I would say um, um, dangerous as uh, uh, only using the scientific evidence when you do policies, because we need, I mean, science is science and policies are policies. If people do not back up the political decisions because they don't understand their role, then uh, we might end up um, running uh, uh, with our eyes closed in high speed, uh, as you said, uh, Yanis, and I think, <laughs> At, at at some point, this is what's happening in Europe now. I don't think we know everything. Uh, future, it's so unpredictable. There will be so many changes. Uh, we will need to be agile and adapt and be, I would say, not only one step ahead uh, related to what our society will need from the forest, but anticipate and also uh, have some kind of a leadership to transform the the public push towards better policies and this is not a, this is not an easy task uh, because if you are only listening to the populistic approaches you will you will have bad policies that will not uh, that will not uh, offer uh, the the solutions for the future of the forest so uh, this is the 2050 future that i see uh, forest playing uh, a vital role a more and more vital role for the sustainable future of our societies but a total different balance of, of uh, services that forests will need to offer uh, in the next 20 years. I can't, I can't see them all, but uh, I can only learn from what happened in the 20, last 20 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you. I think you have been excellent uh, panelists and it was really a good 
in-depth discussion on many of the issues which were so nicely presented uh, at the beginning from Virea. Uh, I will just try to do a very short, uh, a short kind of uh, uh, summary of what we have heard. And uh, I think it's, you know, I was uh, in the commission during the times when we were pretty much discussing uh, the famous question, are the forests, should the forests be dealt under the national legislation or should they be dealt on the European Union level? And <clears throat> I think that even if I will start with uh, something which I think it's no brainer, one size does not fit all. And this was also the conclusion of, uh, of the study. Uh, it's actually this one size does not fit all is not the reason to do it more nationally. It's actually the reason, the reason to do it more together because it's, uh, it's exactly uh, those two things um, which uh, one, needs one needs to take into account. So on one hand, the need for coordination and that we actually find out which policies works best, but this is only part of the answer because the second part of the answer, it's also on which policies we, some region or some country could add more and better than the other, which could be an important European Union uh, value, value added to those kinds of debates. So uh, many of the, uh, the questions were, uh, were also coming out of the presentation like, uh, uh, and one one critical question which I have always seen in the use of the uh, of the forests and the whole cascading principle and so on, it's basically sustainable energy transition and what the, what role there actually forests should play, because you know if I would draw the parallel currently with the critical raw materials because we have learned very quickly that that there will be no renewable energy transition without enormous increase of the critical raw materials. And uh, uh, which led me to very, so there it's not only a question how to get it more and where to get it uh, more safe, which is currently pretty much the policy attention in by all policymakers. But in the first place, it's the answer, how can we meet uh, the human needs in a much more resource efficient way where we can use less and where we can actually make this transition easier? Because if we will not go that way, this is like a vicious circle. So for more energy, you need more materials. For more materials, you need more energy. And where you will stop? Nowhere. So I think it's essential that we somehow draw the line. And uh, by the way, when we talk about uh, that and the role of forests in that, I think it's an important consideration one needs to take into account. One thing which was for me really, uh, we didn't touch it so much in a, in a panel, but it was very clear from the presentation. It's what do you financially support? And I think this is, I, I, I have followed a bit the debate from my own country, Slovenia, recently, uh, where farmers were basically complaining that, uh, uh, complaining about the Natura 2000. Maybe you know, but in Slovenia, we have almost 38% of the land under the Natura 2000, which I think is great because this is a super balancing factor between the current needs and uh, also how to protect something for the future. And But uh, I also believe that the farmers are right, by the way. If somebody is imposing some public needs on your, uh, on your private land, it needs to be compensated with some public money. And I also believe that that public money exists, but we are simply not giving it for that purposes and we are giving it for uh, straightforward income compensation. So I think a lot of those questions are pretty much connected with how we will design, and it will be crucial, how we will design the future common agriculture policy and how those things will be really then dealt with. Uh, and uh, uh, which leads me to the, so we have heard that we have limited data, limiting, limited monitoring capacity, and that uh, pretty much important question with which I'm ending, it's actually policy goal prioritization. And if you would, uh, if I would just repeat you some of the things which Mireya actually mentioned as the recommendations at the end, agree on shared objectives, respect diversity of forestry, involve diversity of voices, connect policy objectives and economic incentives. Uh, then uh, policy impact is central. 
everything should be judged through that. Cross-country dialogue is needed. I would say that the that that the that actually the, the, the that analysis is quite well capturing the the things which we have heard also later on from the panel, and that it's actually very nicely setting us in the right direction and also giving us quite useful advice where our future focus should be. Uh, but just to end and uh, give the floor back to Helga, I think uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the whole debate to date, as well as also the presentation, was a very good and nice proof how important is actually the forest strategy on the European Union level and how important it is that we cooperate and coordinate our efforts. Thank you. Helga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janis. I cannot say how much joy this panel has sparked in me. Uh, I feel the time passed so quickly. It was so interesting to follow your arguments. And I would actually wish to continue for telling the truth. But now that we're coming to an end, let me just uh, say a few concluding remarks. Uh, well, as Anna said, uh, the panel clearly showed that there is an importance uh, to the forest strategy as a guiding policy instrument, and uh, we have shown this not we have seen this not only in Mireya's study, where member countries and also countries outside the European Union are already implementing uh, the forest goals, or let's say not implementing, maybe that's the wrong term, already meeting the forest goals because they uh, have the same priorities uh, already now. But uh, what we have also learned is uh, that the goals of the strategy are important, um, uh, but also trust uh, is needed in forestry. And um, we should not forget about the forest owners because they are the ones that need to implement the goals and the forest managers. And it's very important to reach out to them. Um, but uh, what, for instance, if we then connect this to implementation research, uh, we know that top down implementation doesn't always work best. So maybe we need mixed methods approach or mixed approaches. Um, and in this context, it would be also interesting, uh, given that the forest strategy is a non legally binding instrument. Uh, how EU member countries actually upload their policy priorities. Because if the policy priorities are well uploaded to the European uh, sphere, then uh, the implementation or the downloading is so much more simpler. But as we heard in the panel discussion, um, maybe there needs to be much more dialogue and also um, exchange between high level uh, policy makers on what the European Union goals are and how in the European Union they're met together. Um, but um, last but not least, my final point would also be that what I heard during the panel is that we need to better understand how scientific knowledge can be shared, shared in a more systematic way with forest practitioners and owners. Because as Eva said in her intervention, that we cannot only rely on case studies. And then, um, of course, we have a lot of knowledge about it, but how to systematically um, make this knowledge accessible and available to decision makers and uh, as we also heard from Jornut uh, to uh, actually then um, allow decision makers and policy makers to base their uh, decisions on better knowledge and scientific uh, results. Um, I would just like to thank all the panelists, uh, of course also Pippa, unfortunately we lost her, um, uh, for participating. Oh, now Pippa is coming back, so I can actually say thank you in person. Um, I would really like to thank you all. Uh, it was super enjoyable. Um, we will uh, share the study results very soon. And uh, I would love to uh, then maybe discuss again. <laughs> uh, for the moment, I would like to wish you a very nice afternoon. And ex uh, um, uh, thank you for participating in this Pink Forest event and making it so special. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, I dropped off there. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.